Always one of my favorite sessions of these types of events. Um, not my favorite slot right before lunch. So we got to bring it up here, okay? So we were getting ready. Um, again, I'm Ryan Sheehan. I, I run our technical teams and service delivery teams and really excited to have these gentlemen up here to talk about some AI. It's you know, peer-led, hear from your peers. Um, why don't we do some brief introductions? Jeff, why don't you know, roll who you are, where you live, and uh, type of organization that Mondelez is. I'm Jeff Wright. I am the global solution owner for Gen AI and digital experience at Mondelez. Uh, you probably don't know the brand, but we are Oreo, Sour Patch Kids, Milka, Cadbury, Wheat Thins, Triscuits, Cliff Bar, Perfect Snacks, Tang, almost every product you it's probably It's before have. lunch, dude. Come on. I know, really. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that is I. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. Right. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Brian Jarrow. I'm with Flexential, um, and I am based out of Denver. I have responsibility for our core and strategic engineering team, which is, encompasses um, our design, build, and operate for our cloud platform, our backbone uh, network, and our professional services teams. Thanks for being here. Great, thank you. Chris. Hi, and I'm Chris Scaglione. I run financial operations and serve as our Chief Transformation Officer at Tierpoint. Uh, we're based in St. Louis, and um, I have a very long title, and it's a made-up job. <laughs> I, I like to say I get involved in pretty much every project that I want to and a lot of them that I don't want to. So you know, kind of the steward of our business strategy and making sure that all of our initiatives align with that strategy and we're kind of working on the right things. Awesome. First curveball, uh, I told you guys I wasn't going to stick to script. So um, I heard some BGs walking up, so it got me thinking, what did you listen to on the way... Uh, Way, way to the summit here. I know some of you flew. You drove, Jeff. I did. What was on the, what was on the list? Uh, Slayer. Slayer. Did not see that coming. Okay. Uh, let's see. That was, for me, it'd be a little, um, a little overboard. Uh, a little um, Kanye um, uh, and a little, uh, oh, uh, ACDC. Sorry. Nice. Eclectic mix yeah, between eclectic. Kanye and ACDC. Okay, Chris? Eclectic, but on the plane coming here, it was the uh, Apple Music 90s rock playlist. So, All right. I can nice. dig that. I was Sturgill Simpson myself. The late 1900s. You know. uh, <laughs> cool. All right. Let's get into how, how is, you know, a couple of data center organizations as you talked about. Uh, so, Brian, first, how, how has the evolution of AI really impact the, the data center in industry for, for you? Yeah. I mean, I think you heard a lot of this conversation earlier, right? I mean, first off, you know, with the explosion of AI workloads, power is um, increasingly becoming the challenge, right? How do you get enough power? How do you scale it, right? How do you, um, you know, we, we talk a little bit, you hear people talking about the, the rack density, right? That's certainly, um, you know, very prominent for us at Flexential. And the other piece is network, right? Making sure that we have enough network into the facilities to accommodate that, moving that data around um, for those workloads. Yeah, Chris, similar? Yeah, you know, it, it occurred to me that this, this last panel I don't think there's anything I could say that would describe it any better than those gentlemen mm -hmm. did. They hit all the really important things around power distribution, cooling, advanced cooling technologies, the importance of network, they, they hit them all. I guess the only thing I'd add to it is that they weren't talking theoretically. This stuff is absolutely real. When we used to talk 10, 15 years ago about high density, we were aspiring to 10 kilowatts or 15 kilowatts in a cabinet. and. You know, we, we are operating what we believe to be, at, at, at your point, we're operating what we believe to be the largest AI deployment in one room with 16 megawatts of critical load operating in, in one data center room. And that's, you know, 50 to 60 kilowatts per cabinet live today. And clients like that are, we're, we're having conversations literally this week about that's not enough. They need 130 kilowatts in, in those cabinets to, to be able to scale. So. Um, it's really happening. Yeah, so just, I, I was talking in a previous previous meeting I was just in, and it was, I haven't had so many power and cooling conversations, except when Gen AI is in the conversation. It's, it's definitely changed the types of conversations that we're all having. Um, I have one slide for the group I'm going to use. Let's go ahead and move to this one. Uh, which of the following, for all of you out there, which, which of the following data center modernization initiatives are you currently implementing to support AI efforts? And uh, we'll listen to a little Jeopardy music before then we move it to Jeff a little bit. Thanks. What do you think we've got here? Let's I would say ooh, okay. ooh. all the above. So okay. one person answer. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Jeff. <laughs> you got him with I like, would say all the above is uh, 64%. <laughs> Upgrading network. 
adopting AI powered. Okay. All right. A few number of. Uh, okay. It looks like all of the above seems to be a common problem. So it is power. It's all network. Um, really, what we're hearing. I, let's switch gears just a little bit. So, Mondelez, you have 100,000 employees. You told me that, that you're responsible yeah, for supporting and global. And uh, it's it's. We talked about the use cases for AI. I hate. I hate the idea of AI and everything, AI in your toaster, AI in your oven, AI everywhere. And it, it's, it's, it's disheartening sometimes how everyone says, here's the solution. But for us, like speech synthesis is, that's the game changer. As a company of ours that says globular, and it's my made up word, but <laughs> we're a globular company and we have so many languages. I mean, you name it, Japanese, uh, Australian, uh, you know, we have all these different languages across the, and it's, it's, we used to take so many cycles to do change management, documents, knowledge base, to disperse it for big, big things we're doing. And now it's, you can have a document translated into a hundred and something different languages uh, quickly in hours and give the user uh, unable to, like the, the able to select any language they want. And I, a lot of people say like, well, English is the language of business, but it's, so often we miss the people that have it as a second language. They don't always get it. And when you can do Portuguese, Brazilian, and, and you know, French or whatever, it's, it shows that we care about our customers or our employees too. Sure. Uh, um, I heard a lot from, from our SHI MindSpark team about use cases. You were talking to me last night at dinner about the use case or training, the, the video use case that you were talking about. You want to go into that a little bit? So again, all the trainings we currently do for God knows what, you know, manufacturing, factories, just, just, you know, SAP change type things. It allows you to quickly do these videos with an avatar, click and drag, and you're, you're already having like a, whoever you want, your audience, you just name it. And again, it, it comes up with a relatively flawless training in hours instead of weeks or months. So now your change is now impacting the world quickly. We're, we're all about quick now. So you can do it so quick, whereas it used to take months, sometimes a year, to do big, massive changes at a company as globular as ours. <laughs> as globular. <laughs> you heard it here first, globular. Globular. Um, cool, so you can kind of tell our, our belief is there's workforce modernization and then infrastructure data center factory. So clearly we, we have representation of both those up here, but Chris, um, you know, as, as companies out here look to invest in, in deploy AI infrastructure, what do you think some of the requirements they should consider up front first before deploying that they should go into considering your background? Yeah, the, um, it, it probably makes you question whether you want to be in the business of operating your own data center. And I know that sounds self-serving for someone like myself or, or Brian, <laughs> or, but, but truly trying to keep up is, is um, darn near impossible right now. Um, so, so the, you know, I, without going into like specific things, again, I think the last panel talked about a lot of the facility specific elements that are important. Just the fact of planning ahead is of critical importance right now. Um, if, if, if you don't have the right technologies in your data center, if you want to keep doing it yourself, it's going to take you at least a year to get the equipment. Um, at least a year, probably more like 18 to 24 months to get enough power delivered to the site. And that same thing holds for a data center operator or yourself, if you're gonna do it yourself. So planning ahead has never been more important. I mean, anything to add on? Yeah, no, I think that it's a, it's great to Chris's point, right? Plan ahead and just know that, you know, that when you start looking out there and I mean, data centers, you know, companies like us are out there doing that today, right? On behalf of, of our customers. But that space and power is at a premium. And to Chris's point, like that, the, the power is critical, right? And, and when you start looking at, cons, you know, you know, contracting for that power, making sure that that whoever you're contracting with can actually deliver that, right? At the end of the day, that's what it's going to matter. You can, you can have their space ready in 18 months, but if you don't have power there, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good. There's a lot of dispersed controls now that allow you to, instead of having it all centralized, we're all trying to get power in these massive data centers. There's a lot of people in think tanks now, if you have 50, 100,000 laptops, that dispersed energy consumption, you have 100,000 employees around the world, you don't have to actually have the power concentrated if you leverage everyone's local power and the compute they have on their stack. You beef up the stack, and now instead of having that, let's all jam in water cooling and nuclear and all this other stuff, 
you can leverage the power grid around the world in a more elastic kind of way. And I honestly believe that that's gonna be really the future. We all keep like getting up nuclear plants and all these other things. You keep jamming all this stuff, it's never gonna be able to scale until we have like cold fusion, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Too globular. <laughs> globular, cold fusion. Um, let, let's switch, uh, Jeff, stick, stick with you on this. In, in your opinion, and I know you have many, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> For AI adoption in enterprise, what do you think is the most important first step? Uh, exposure to the technology. You, you gotta give people the toys. You gotta give people access to the toolbox. Within, again, ethical, uh, you know, no matter how you, just give people access. Uh, give them a quick little tutorial and say, go at it. You know, you know Gen AI for images, for you know, Copilot. A lot of companies don't want people using Copilot right now, right? They're like, well, no, we can't, we're not sure yet. Everyone I know, and again, my brother's at Microsoft, so maybe I'm a little biased, but people that are using Copilot now, it's like they're able to really focus on the important stuff and all the redundant, like repetitive, like nine billion emails, they can just go like, yeah, reply, 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 reply. And it makes the work move a little faster and it allows you to concentrate your focus on the more important stuff. Yeah, uh, eliminate toil is one of our um, yeah, no objectives, you know, that we're trying to do with our own internal. What is toil, anybody? What is toil? <laughs> Globular. Globular. Um, you guys chime in. Like, what do you, what do you think? What are the first steps? To like, either inside of Flex Central or as you're you're working with customers yeah, and I these mean, types of things. To add on to what Jeff was saying, I think you know, you're helping our employees and our, our teams understand how to leverage AI. Right? What are those use cases? Where does it make sense? And then to your really point, is like, how do you what how do you actually use it? Right? I mean, giving them those trainings, right, to, to help them understand how it can help them be more efficient and they can leverage that going forward and not just you know. Not just as a search engine, right? But you know, actually have it do some some meaningful work for them. Cool. You know, just just one thought, and I think it was brought up maybe in a, in a couple of different discussions earlier today. Uh, we think about, especially from a data center perspective, AI driving, and you know, the, and and GPUs driving a lot more compute intensity, which of course they do. But there's also still the importance of data is is actually has has actually never been higher. Um, if if you, you, know, you can't functionally, from a business perspective, do a meaningful Gen AI type initiative, even for the smallest use case, unless you have the right data. We, again, we heard, we heard a lot about that mm -hmm. earlier today. So um, it's not just about compute, which I think a lot of people's minds immediately go to. It's also about data. And then that gets into storage and the proliferation of data, which has, you know, was the problem we were most focused on the past several years. And that problem really hasn't gone away. I shouldn't say problem. That challenge hasn't gone away. We just have, we just kind of added to it. Opportunity. Opportunity is what it is. You yeah, got that, it. You got that, it. that data has gravity depending on where it's at and how it yeah. applies to what infrastructure you're gonna deploy or do it in the cloud, et cetera. Are you all thinking, it like, is it a hurdle today? Is it a, is it a challenge? It's like, how are you solving it? Maybe Jeff first. It's really, it's, it's having a little bit of both. Most companies now, I think, are pulling a lot of their stuff back. AWS, GCP, Azure, everyone all of saw their spend go through the roof. And they, they figured just shifting and lifting or lifting and shifting all their stuff over that it was gonna solve it. And it's just that same bad architecture and that same bad stuff just got moved to the cloud and it's costing a lot of money. Now all of a sudden they're like, well, maybe we should bring some of the stuff back in. So we're a hybrid. We have data centers, we have companies doing some cool stuff in house, but of course we leverage, you know, GC, we, love, we leverage them all. So I think that that's the, that's the happy medium. You gotta have a little bit of, little bit of both. I would say from a Flexential standpoint, right, we certainly have our, our customers are in that same boat, right? Exactly right. They're, we're seeing that repatriation, that discussion about how do I have a hybrid workload? How do I ensure and, and start taking some of those more costly applications and workloads and moving them back into the data center, right? So it's, it's more cost effective. And kind of back to your earlier point, Ryan, about, you know, if people are thinking about data centers, you, the, Chris, you brought a great point about storage, right? You know, you start thinking and, and trying to plan you gotta ask yourself, how much space am I going to need as, as, as my data needs continue to grow, right? right? And that's a, a big question. Is that something that uh, customers really wanna take on themselves or leverage you know, uh, a third party provider like, you know, like TierPoint or FlexEngine? Yeah, data redundancy is another one. AI is actually doing a pretty good job. If you have the same files and the same stuff in the same places, and it's like you know, terabytes and mm -hmm. petabytes, it does a good job of going, no, 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 redundancy throws it out. Yep. That's a powerful thing, right? You can reduce your overhead but pretty quickly if you just, you know, let that lion loose. Yeah, and if we look at the majority of the room, they're, you know, it's edge computing, it's network infrastructure, I'm sure storage is in there as well. So all of these considerations of then how to like 
actually leverage the data to do something meaningful, meaningful to get that outcome in AI. Um, what, uh, let's start with Chris, and we'll just go down the couch here. What most excites you, and what are you most concerned about with AI, either in your professional world or your personal world? Oh, gosh. Um, and this is off script, so these guys are right off the cuff. Yeah, so. no, these are the best kind. These are the best kind. <laughs> Um, most exciting is, I, I would say, just the, um, uh, I, I don't think we've seen a, a technology that, that has accelerated as quickly as Gen AI has. Um, I, I often find myself comparing it to just cloud in general. Um, you know, where, where you know, everyone had everything on premise in their own you know, data center, managed it themselves, and kind of gradually, it took, it took years and years and years for everyone to kind of get comfortable with Azure and AWS. Um, people are really, really comfortable with uh, ChatGPT and, and all the other LLMs right now. And, and, it, and it's almost every day there's a new announcement. So that, that, that's super exciting. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll give you an unusual answer, and there's a lot of things that, that scare me about it, and I think they're all pretty obvious. But one, one uh, gentleman that I spoke with a couple of months ago who's really um, you know, has done deep dives into, into AI and done a lot, of, uh, a lot of projects related to it, says he's most afraid of his, his kids uh, becoming less polite. <laughs> so they, they, the kids go on to chat GPT and they just start making demands. It's not, you know, there's, there's no please, there's no thank you, there's no common courtesy. I never would have thought of that, but you know, if, if that becomes the main mode of problem solving and communication with a non-human, maybe we should be a little bit concerned about the niceties of life. Um, it might be a little bit of a stretch, but interesting answer. Cool. Yeah, I think for, for me, it's similar to Chris, like the, the excitement for me is just, you know, the, the, the consistent or the, the constant um, different use cases that, that we find in AI, right? And as you pointed out, Chris, like every, you know, every day, every week, right, we're finding new ways and, and new things that AI can do for us, which is exciting. Also a little bit challenging, like a little bit scary, right? Just the things that it can, that, you know, it's starting to be able to do on its own. Um, I think that becomes a challenge is how do we, you know, how do we harness that? And some people were talking about that earlier. I think, but you know, I guess the, one of the pieces that does kind of give me some pause um, is, you know, how, how do we make sure that we don't, to the next generations, you know, our kids, et cetera, that it doesn't, be, it doesn't start to replace that human interaction, right? You know, I think, you know, for, you know, I think we've all, we, a lot of us value that today, right? We, you know, it's a piece of uh, how we are and how we've grown up and, and um, our own skills in that area, right? And so how can we make sure that we continue to leverage that and our, our, we teach that and not just get consumed by the ability to just quickly do it online with, a, with an avatar? Yeah, cool, Jeff. Uh, infotech and biotech coming together is the most exciting thing. Um, if any of you guys are not tracking the, you know, the, the therapeutics, you know, the work that's being done on mapping out sequences for people that were type one diabetic that now have their pancreas working again. I mean, it is mind blowing how we're gonna in, increase our health or qualitative and quantitative life. But at that same time, it's gonna be a financial thing. You know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, if you can have an enhancement or some kind of a cognitive, uh, you know, update, and now you're able to afford the, you know, ups, you're a cyborg, basically. But <laughs> at a level that we've never really seen. And at the same time, this, the scary piece is gonna be the other side of that, where we're all like getting better in life we're gonna be worse when it comes to the algorithm. The algorithms now, they know what you're looking for. They know what you're seeing. They track your eye. I was joking with somebody. We all know those, you know those coupons you get at the grocery store that you pull a coupon out? Does everyone know that, right? They track those times between the coupons you grab. Even more so now, they track everything in grocery stores to see your eye in contact for certain items. And it's, it's supposed to help you, right? That's that double-edged sword. It's supposed to help you buy something you want. It's supposed to help you so you don't have to make that decision, you know? But that's gonna be a scary thing uh, for a lot of people where I no longer have the ability to make a decision because the algorithm knows what I want already. Could be good, could be uh, Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and even uh, with John and Aaron, we're talking about our own internal, you know, deployment of our, our MindSpark and AI app is some of that initial resistance from our employees of like, this is going to replace my job. And it's like, that's, that's not the intent it's to help you be able to do more and do better and do faster. And yeah, protect the workers, not the jobs. The jobs are going to be, the jobs are going to change no matter what. Like every industrial revolution, every revolution is going to change. Protect the workers. 
upskill. That's why I tell all my people that are into, interested in the Gen AI, I'm like, here you go. Take the trainings free. There's so many trainings for free around this stuff. It's stupid. You know, take the training, figure it out if you're interested in it. It's going to impact every business, period. Yeah. So you all are, are, are well along in your AI journeys, both at your organizations and just your own, your own knowledge. What do you think has been the biggest challenge that you think maybe the folks in the room can, can help more quickly get over that challenge or hurdle that you've had in your, in, in your journey with your, your AI uh, expertise? Uh, let's start with, start with Brian in the middle. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, we talked, some of the guys earlier were talking about, uh, you know, bring, for example, cooling, right? Bringing liquid into the data centers, right? When you start looking at, you know, how do we take advantage of these technologies, right? They, they, they are very, uh, you know, very heat and CPU and, and GPU intensive. So, you know, for us, for me, like just, you know, getting at that comfort level of, um, of how do we, you know, how do we accelerate that adoption of these different um, cooling and uh, and thermal technologies, right? And so we start looking at bringing that, you know, those liquid into, you know, these are non-conductive, you know, liquids that bring in, but you know, they're they're going to need to happen, right? You can't get to, you know, 130 to 200 to 300 kilowatts per rack without those types of technologies, right? And so, you know, the 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 quicker that you can come to grips with the fact that it's going to be there and it's going to need to be there if we want to adopt these types of technologies then that's, that's going to help us kind of as a, as a team, as a group, accelerate. Cool. Chris? Yeah, um, I'll give you a quick two-part answer. Um, sure. Exactly what, you know, you totally agree with Brian, just what, with what Brian just said as far as being a data center operator and preparing to serve our clients in different ways. Um, that, you know, we, we are focusing a ton of our effort in that right now. We, we, we got pretty lucky, to be honest, um, about six or seven years ago, uh, we were introduced uh, to, a, to a, a small startup company um, that, that manufactures and engineers designs cabinets. Uh, they're a combination of liquid and air cooling, very, very dynamic control down to the rack unit level of, um, of you know, where to direct the cooling. Um, and uh, we, we've been working with that te technology. We like to say we've made every possible mistake we could over these past six or seven years. Um, but we now, you know, everyone wants it because you know there, there weren't too many organizations that needed that level of density, and now everyone does. So we we found ourselves in a really good spot that we learned a lot of these lessons already, um, finding ourselves learning more and more every day. So that that that's part of it. The second part of the answer, though, is just from our business perspective, our the beginning of our AI journey um, was not very exciting. It was not very sexy. <laughs> we we figured out we had we had a big data problem. Um, and so, so we've had to go through and look at our business applications, everything from you know, kind of our, our lead to cash applications, our financials, you know, everything, every, kind of everything in between, and have had to re-engineer those so that we could do two things, get the data that we needed, obviously, but also take advantage of what some of the, plat the application platform providers are doing in this space, like ServiceNow and Salesforce, so that we can take, a, you know, we, we don't have to build everything ourselves. We can tap into what they're doing. We can tap into the LLMs. So really a hybrid application model. I just made that up. That's not really a, a, a term. But, but it's globular. Um, but, it, but it's, it's definitely globular, and we know that much. Um, so, so you know, our, our journey started very non-exciting, but uh, we had to do it if we're going to do it right. Yeah, cool. Jeff, biggest challenge, hurdle you've overcome? Yeah, ethics. So we had an AI board set up because so many people were concerned around the ethics of AI. And specifically, I'm on the creative side of things for, you know, show me a polar bear in outer space eating an Oreo. And the IP for that and all of our brand assets, it was, a, it was very challenging to show without a shadow of a doubt that, that those assets weren't getting out into the, the wild. And there's a very, you know, everyone knows Dolly and all these other cool things that they're doing on the visual side of things. But very few companies, uh, one of which, again, we work with Adobe. Adobe from start, their, their dam was siloed. So when we all remember the days of like coming up with prompting and pictures, you know, you'd see like a shutter stock, like, you know, mm -hmm. watermark. I mean, these things were bad. You, you, you don't want that. Whereas a lot of companies that are doing it right can show you that source. They know where the asset came from. They know where the visual is coming from. And it's trained on their stock, which they own. So ethics was a big part of making sure that what we do does not 
steal any IP from any other company. Legally, that is, you can end a company, even big company, you can end a company if you start accidentally stealing things from other people. Yeah, it's a good one. Don't steal. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Um, what advice or nugget of info uh, can you provide for the, the folks out here that you think they could, they could take back and maybe apply as soon as they get back to their office? Um, let's go Jeff down the couch. Come up with like a cool idea that's a simple win for a use case. I, do, I did that, I do that. If you see a really, really low hanging fruit that Gen AI or AI can help your, your employees, do a quick video. I know we, we, we all talk about people who are introverted. Find somebody that's extroverted. It doesn't have to be you, but if it's your idea, find somebody that has a good voice at your company and say, hey, let's do a little like, let's do a panel. Let's do something goofy. Let's get stupid. Let's get funny and try to get people to loosen up around it to understand it. And if you do that and you make that the conduit to get people to understand it a little bit better, it'll help, your, it'll help everyone because this stuff is coming and it's coming fast. And if you don't have your employees adjust to it a little bit or a lot, in fun ways, then it's, you're going to be challenged. Everyone's going to be challenged. So do something stupid and fun. There's my advice. All right, Brian. Uh, I love that, Jeff. Um, <laughs> I'll say, I think just as you get back, you know, you start thinking more and more, start, try to find those use cases that you think are actually applicable inside of your own, your own business, right? And then as, as Jeff pointed out, share them with your colleagues. Like understand how can those uh, applications be used and then start thinking about how could you um, how do you start to implement those? And that's where I think, you know, I would encourage you to don't do it on your own. Reach out to your partners, right? Whether that's, you know, folks like Flexential, Tierpoint, SHI, have those conversations, right? Ask the questions about, hey, this is what we're thinking. You know, help us understand this because, you know what, a lot of us have done, have gone through a lot of these heartaches as, as Chris was pointing out, right? We've experimented, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons. We don't know everything yet, but we are absolutely or else willing to share that with each one of you, right? So just don't, don't think you have to go out there and do it on your own. And encourage your teams to do the same thing, right? Just, just make sure that you're, you're not trying to process this by yourself. Cool, Chris? I, I think it's be more globular, is that, is that right? Globular. Okay. Okay. You gotta say it right there, Chris. Right. You gotta say it right, yeah. exactly. Globular. No, um, I, I, think, uh, I think it's, and, and I'll give a pitch for, for SHI here, you know, do, do, do an assessment up front. You know, think, think through and determine what you really need. Um, Penny talked earlier about you know, um, Microsoft and OpenAI doing a five gigawatt data center campus. You don't need that. You don't need a five gigawatt <laughs> data center. Um, but, but if but, you but, do. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't, we don't have one in general. No, no, we don't either. Yeah, no, no, you're right. But the, you know, just understand what you really need. What does your infrastructure really need to look like to support your use cases? Um, how, how is that going to grow? And, and you've got to think, like I said before, you've got to think a year, two, maybe three years ahead as best you can. I know it's very difficult, um, but, but plan it out and really understand what it is that you need and it might be uh, more doable. You might be able to bite it off in more digestible pieces than you think. Sure, so I, I got uh, plan and assess up front. Do, don't, don't do it on your own. Make it fun and silly. Um, I think that I think that's some pretty good advice from you all. I, I'd like to thank these gentlemen for taking the time to come out here and speak to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. That that wraps our morning main general sessions in here. So I, I hope you found it a valuable use of your time this morning. I, I know I know we did on the SHI side. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. There is lunch uh, out around the corners, I believe, where you had breakfast this morning. There'll be people out there to help. Just ask questions and follow the masses. So we have, we have lunch now. You'll go into the afternoon sessions, uh, and you should have that listed out on, on your agendas. And uh, at the end of the day, there'll be a QR code. We would love your feedback. Please provide us. The, uh, it's a survey. Please provide your, your, your genuine feedback on the day. And most importantly, if there are things you heard here today that you want to take action on, let us know. We're, we're here to help. We want to help you on this journey, and we're excited to do it with you. So thanks for a great morning, and let's have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Good job, Good job guys. Thank you, everyone.